through a combination of childhood scrapbooks, childhood following it, and a combination of enjoying the art of making uniforms and understanding the colors and stripes and patterns, I just acquired this vast knowledge, which I thought was just something I liked. Little did I know that I was going to turn it into a business that would have all this national and international attention. Then you are in Australia right now. You're talking NBA basketball. You're talking great teams. You're talking great individual players. Takes it off and there's number 23. And of course, Johnny goes nuts. So we're all getting first bumps thinking about it now. I just tried to go out there and play my game. I have no idea what you're talking about, Adam. I don't like anybody. I'm not a people person. Strand, you made the pass. Yes. Christian, can you catch the ball? Yes. All the stars were aligned and all the muscles fired at the right time. And I was able to get off the ground and throw one down. I was saving that as a surprise for you. And now, introducing your host for In All Airness, Adam Ryan. Welcome to episode 66. Thanks for joining me. Stay up to date with my monthly email newsletter. You'll receive exclusive details on upcoming podcast episodes, future high-profile guests to appear on the show, and much more. Simply visit inallairness.com slash news. Today, I'm excited to welcome the founder of Mitchell & Ness Nostalgia Company, Peter Capolino, to the show. We discuss the fascinating history behind the iconic vintage sports apparel company. Thank you, Peter, for making yourself available to chat. Show notes for this episode, including links to numerous topics covered, are at inallairness.com slash 66. Now, on to the show. My guest today has a steeped history in sports. His family owned Mitchell & Ness Nostalgia Company for more than 50 years. Peter Capolino, thanks for joining me. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and talk to you. I really appreciate the chance to connect with you today. Really looking forward to our chat. Now, before we actually get into all things Mitchell & Ness, I'd love to ask you about your younger years. This podcast is all about sports history and particularly basketball. I've been obsessed with its history since I was about 14 years old, which goes back to about 1989. What was your family's relationship to sports when you were growing up, Peter? Well, my family's relationship to sports uh, when I was growing up was always Mitchell and Ness. I'll give you a quick little history of, of Mitchell and Ness, how it came into existence and how I came to owning it. Mitchell and Ness was founded in 1904 by Pete Mitchell, an Englishman, and Charles Ness, a Scotsman. They formed Mitchell and Ness in Philadelphia in 1904 to manufacture uh, golf and tennis rackets, and mostly golf clubs, actually. Uh, Mr. Ness imported a lot of components from Scotland, and the uh, clubs were assembled uh, at Mitchell and Ness by local golf pros. That lasted until 1929. It, my father was born in Formia, Italy in 1904. His name was Sisto Capolino. Uh, He came to America in 1913 uh, because there was a cholera epidemic in Italy. Uh, His mother died on the boat on the way over, and his father died shortly after uh, he remarried and uh, settled in Philadelphia. Uh, My father did not pretty much like the family that he was left with when his parents were gone, but he was educated and had been educated in Italy. And Mr. Mitchell and Mr. Ness in 1917 took my dad in and let him live and work at the company. And my dad was 13 years old in 1917. Uh, They renamed him James because they didn't like the Italian name Sisto. He was known as James Capolino. So my dad started as a 13-year-old boy at Mitchell & Ness in 1917. He stayed there his whole life. Uh, He bought the company in 1952. He died in 1978. And uh, I took it over completely in 1978 after he died. I grew up working at Mitchell & Ness as long as I can remember. I'm 70 years old now, and I probably started at Mitchell & Ness when I was 10 or 11 or 12 years old. Mitchell & Ness had more of a history in baseball and football than it did in the NBA in the early days. Um, From 1933 until 1963, Mitchell & Ness completely outfitted the Philadelphia Eagles. In fact, when the Eagles won the NFL championship in 1960, Uh, I was one of the young men, I was in 10th grade, reconditioning and installing face masks on the Eagles' helmets for the uh, 1960 championship game when they beat the Green Bay Packers. Wow. In baseball, 
Mitchell and Ness uh, outfitted uh, the Philadelphia Athletics much more than the Philadelphia Phillies. Um, the Philadelphia Athletics moved to Kansas City and are now known as the Oakland Athletics. But in the 40s and early 50s, Mitchell and Ness completely outfitted the Philadelphia Athletics uh, as well as outfitting the Philadelphia Eagles. We did not have a strong basketball relationship with the Philadelphia Warriors or the Philadelphia 76ers. But I grew up in a town in Delaware County called Yaden, which was a very strong basketball town. And I played a lot of basketball and loved it. So my love of basketball, along with a strong love of football and baseball, were really the, uh, the roots and the foundation of me creating the Mitchell and Ness Nostalgia Company in uh, 1988. But as a child, I would sneak in to uh, Convention Hall or the arena. These are names of uh, facilities where pro basketball was played in Philadelphia. And I very vividly remember as a 10-year-old during the 1955-56 championship when the Philadelphia Warriors beat the Fort Wayne Pistons four games to one, I was at one of those games as a kid. And basketball was always a great love of mine. When I started the Mitchell and Ness Nostalgia Company, I really started it with baseball because I had discovered wool flannel in an old factory and came up with the idea of making vintage wool flannel baseball uniforms. Um, Sports Illustrated in 1987 did a big story on me. And of course, Major League Baseball sued me. But they made me the offer, the godfather offer that I couldn't resist. They said, uh, you need to come into business for us and do this for us or we'll put you out of business. So I said, all right, I'll do it for you. And for 10 years, from 1988 until 1998, I only recreated the history of Major League Baseball. I probably researched and made about 900 to 1,000 different vintage baseball jerseys, going back from 1901 all the way up into the late 1980s. But basketball was something, and football were two things that I really loved. And in 1998, uh, the NBA came, and they actually asked me if I would recreate the history of the NBA for them uh, as I had done for Major League Baseball. And that was a dream come true. So in 1998, uh, I got my first license with the NBA and started recreating the history of the NBA. Uh, I know you told me you were, a, or I heard that you were an, an ABA fan as well. And living in an NBA city, I was not as familiar with the ABA as, as the NBA and some of the old NBA players. But it was great, great fun to start recreating players of my childhood and even earlier than my childhood of the NBA. Tom Gola, who was a, uh, one of the, uh, voted one of the 50 greatest players of all time, was a Philadelphia Warrior. And uh, I knew him and I knew some other players. And they actually brought their uniforms into me and lent them to me so that I could recreate them very, very accurately. For me, the recreation probably wasn't as hard as for other people because I'd been in the sporting goods business all of my life, and I had many relationships with manufacturers all over the United States who were eager to uh, recreate some of the uniforms they had originally made, but recreate them for me. So that's, that's sort of a short and long history. By 2000, uh, I had acquired an NFL license, so I was able to recreate all the uh, the great football players of the Philadelphia Eagles and all the other teams. And then in 2001, uh, I finally got a license with the NHL to uh, recreate uh, NHL vintage jerseys. Um, the NHL was very new to Philadelphia. It didn't arrive until 1967-68 with the Philadelphia Flyers. So that's a very long answer to a, a short question about my love of the NBA and how I got involved in it. Oh, it's fantastic. That leads so many different spots that I could probably go to with questions from here. But um, did you actually have a, a favorite sport? Was there one that stood out above the rest? Uh, I think the NFL stood out amongst the rest. You know, I mean, I grew up as a kid inside that locker room and uh, went to all the training camps and uh, uh, the players would hang out at our store. So, I mean, it's hard as a youngster not to be impressed by all that. So the, the Philadelphia Eagles, we did a lot of work for the New York Giants and the Washington Redskins as well, but mostly the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, you know, it's funny when I, I got a license for the uh, the NFL uh, because you're working, you're, you're sort of required to go to all the Super Bowls and go to all the other things because you're a, you're a licensee and you manufacture clothes on behalf of them. 
But after a certain number of years, I got so tired of it, I started giving all my tickets to the employees and let them all go. Oh, wow. Except when the Philadelphia Eagles are in the Super Bowl, and that was only once. <laughs> That's fantastic. What an incredible scenario to be involved in. Um, speaking of producing the products that Mitchell and Ness has been so widely known for, how did the technology change over the decades that you were involved? I'm sure that as it got more and more advanced, did that necessarily mean that it made it easier to reproduce these items from yesteryear or was there some difficulty still? The items from yesteryear were, were probably a little more difficult to produce because the fabrics used in the jerseys. Now, the earliest jerseys that I really made uh, were, were teams like the uh, Chicago Stags and the Fort Wayne Pistons, uh, the early Boston Celtics from 1946-47. I didn't go much uh, earlier than the first year. You know, the, the NBA was really created in 1949-50 when the BAA and the NBL merged. And then the, the name NBA came into existence. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, in football, the All-American Football Conference and the National Conference merged after the 1949 season, and they became known as the NFL. So right around the same period of time, the NBA and the NFL really uh, coincided with the creation of their two leagues by merging two competing leagues. Back to your question about the uniforms. Um, in the early days, the uniforms were made of cotton and rayon. Earlier than that, the basketball uniforms were made out of wool, but I decided not to do that. So 1946, 47, up into the 50s, uh, the uniforms were cotton rayon, and they were knit on machines that are not really readily available. So it was a bit of a challenge. Um, there were three or four manufacturers around the country who could still make the vintage uniforms. There was a lot of bolts of material and fabrics that were sitting dormant in factories and manufacturing locations that people didn't want. They were actually using them for linings, for jackets and things like that. I went around and uh, bought up a lot of fabric and started recreating the jerseys as historically accurately as I could. I remember I made a 1946-47 Celtics jersey for a player named Connie Simmons, who nobody knows. It's a short sleeve jersey, which is very cool. But Connie Simmons, you know, happened to wear number six, which was Bill Russell's number. Right. I made it with the number six, and uh, I marketed it as a Connie Simmons, but everybody bought it because they liked Bill Russell's number. All right. Those challenges lasted um, from probably 1998 into the 2000s, uh, and when we started to get really popular. There was no more yarns available, and that's when I was really forced to go offshore and duplicate these yarns in places like Korea, odd places like Peru, uh, Taiwan, and places where I could find companies that could manufacture the, the knit jerseys uh, similar to what they were worn in the period. Um, there still were domestic manufacturers that could do the stuff that was later on. So like the Golden State Warriors, when I would make all of those San Francisco Warriors jerseys and things of Rick Barry and all of that, those fabrics were uh, known as green cotton and nylon. They were still available in the United States. Uh, I could make a lot of those jerseys in the U.S. Uh, as we get more modern and into the mesh era, uh, that's available worldwide, and that was not nearly the, the problem that, uh, or the challenge that it was uh, in the early days. I watched a YouTube clip where you talked about some customers who would often ask if they can have a player's name put on the back of their uniform. However, your attention to detail wouldn't allow that sort of thing to happen if the player's jersey didn't actually have the name printed or stitched onto it so i'm guessing that must have led to some interesting conversations with customers who wanted to get that name put on yes it did i mean i to this day and you must know i i actually sold mitchell and ness in 2008 to adidas mm -hmm. and i stayed on for four more years and i still consult with them and and i i still feel like i'm a part of the foundation and a part of the family but i made sure, and to this day, Mitchell and Ness does, that if the player did not wear his name on the back of the jersey, you don't get it. Uh, you can probably go to another manufacturer and get a replica of a replica. In other words, there was, there's people that make less expensive versions of what we do, and they, they don't care about putting the name on the back or not. They, they just want to market the individual. So I've never compromised on that.
I love the fact that, yeah, you paid so much attention to detail there. And I read somewhere in the research for our chat today that a friend of yours named Bob Downs, yeah. you would work together and got very involved in the research and, and going through archives and looking at game film and visiting various halls of fame uh, around the country to make sure that the historical accurateness was uh, actually adhered to. Yes, Bob. Bob Downs passed away recently, but he he was a Federal Reserve banker here in Philadelphia, and Bob played a big role in my baseball research. Mm -hmm. I did have some other people, specifically a man named Paul Pogarin, who uh, did a lot of research for me at libraries. In the early days, before the internet, uh, and before there was color photography, and this more relates to baseball than it does to basketball. That's fun. Color photography really only came into existence around 1938. And so for the baseball uniforms, we would go to the newspaper archives at the major museums and, and libraries around the country, and we would read the day before opening day of baseball, the day of opening day of baseball, and the day after opening day of baseball. And the reason was the sports writers wrote very colorful columns about the teams and the uniforms that they wore. And so if I didn't have a real uniform or there was not a great deal of research or the Baseball Hall of Fame didn't have a specimen, we would get the colors from the sports writers. Um, it's one of the reasons that we got the colors of the uh, uh, 1937 Brooklyn Dodgers being Kelly Green and White, which no one ever th knew. But it was reported in the uh, in the newspaper that the Dodgers uh, luck was so bad to change their luck. They, they wanted to use the luck of the Irish and be Kelly Green for one year. Oh, that's fantastic. And, you know, when we looked at all the imagery in black and white, you could not tell that. There was many things like that. The uh, the Baltimore Orioles in 1901 uh, wore a, a yellow O rather than the orange O that you see today. Um, and that went on and on and on in, in the world of baseball. By the time basketball came around, there was uh, enough color that made it a little bit easier. And and football, too, there was enough color. I, I didn't do much NFL football prior to the late 1940s. Just your overall understanding of the different major league sports and all the different jerseys and designs over the years you have a, a great recall already i can tell straight away that your recall and understanding of that is is phenomenal so did that just come because of your obsession with being involved in the industry well i i must tell you i'm, I'm going to be 71 in three weeks and my recall is starting to fade <laughs> you're doing a great job today that's for sure <laughs> but you know um it was funny. Um, I never thought this would turn into a business like this, but I recall making scrapbooks as a kid. Sports Illustrated, its first issue was in 1954, but prior to Sports Illustrated, there was a magazine called Sport Magazine. And Sport Magazine started in the 40s and actually lasted for quite a long time, up into the 70s, maybe even the 80s. But I recall as a kid making scrapbooks and cutting out all the color pictures in the sports magazines and pasting them in and loving these little scrapbooks I had. I still have a vision of Richie Ashburn in 1950 uh, in his white and red pinstripe uniform in my scrapbook, amongst many other things. So it started there. Uh, when I got into Mitchell and as active as an adult in 1970 and continued to follow uh, all of the sports, I knew who the manufacturers were that made the uniforms for the teams because we were dealing with them. And so it was very helpful to me. Our Mitchell and Ness company, we outfitted about a thousand high schools and colleges throughout the country in uh, in uniforms. And so I had a, a vast knowledge of the colors and striping of uniforms. Um, the NFL has lost uh, most of its traditional sleeve striping, but most of that traditional sleeve striping in the NFL came from college football and teams that uh, I think today the University of Iowa still uses the traditional Pittsburgh Steelers uh, sleeve stripe. But the way modern uniforms are configured, you, you wouldn't be able to have a sense of, of the history of, of the uniforms. Through a combination of childhood scrapbooks, childhood following it, and a combination of enjoying the art of making uniforms and understanding the colors and stripes and patterns, I just acquired this vast knowledge, which I thought was just something I liked. Little did I know that I was going to turn it into a business that would have all this national and international attention. 
that's an absolutely fantastic outcome as well. Just your passion and love for it spawned into becoming an actual business idea as well. How would Mitchell and S decide on what particular products to remake given the incredible array of uniforms and notable players and even not so notable over the years? I decided on all of them and I made the players I like and if I didn't like the player, I wouldn't make his uniform. <laughs> <laughs> because on my podcast here, I've had some really high profile guests on here. You mentioned Rick Barry before. I had Rick Barry on the show and we chatted about his career. And then I really also enjoy chatting with the journeyman players. And that's with all respect calling them journeymen. But I love to hear about their stories as well. So certain players over the years throughout the decades have appealed to me as well. So I can understand that you might want to just choose players that you're most interested in as well. So I find that quite fascinating. Well, you have to understand, I was doing it I was doing it from about 1984 until that Sports Illustrated in 1987. Once I got a license with the Ligs and they let me stay in business, I had to expand and make more players than I wanted to. When you do this on a national level, you have to represent all of the teams and you also have to pay royalties. I mean, I paid royalties to all the Ligs. I also paid royalties to the individual players whose jerseys I made. Right. And because of the uh, the business minimums that uh, people who are in the manufacturing business who have licenses with Ligs, I had to greatly expand the selection more than just my you know list of uh, fun players that I like. So when you're talking about negotiating these licensing deals with the Ligs, how involved do they get? Obviously, I don't want to go into any specifics, of course, but how involved would the negotiations be and how long would it normally take or did it vary between each pro league? It didn't take very long with any of them because uh, what had happened is when Major League Baseball came to me in uh, 1987 and then in 1988, no one had thought of recreating the history of these pro sports through the evolution of the uniforms. It was an idea that never crossed their mind. So for me, in those days, all of the contracts that I struck were relatively easy and were um, simple to, to get through. It was not a, a huge process. Now, in 2015, because uh, things are much more commercialized in 2015 than they were in 1987, uh, the contracts are large and complex with huge amounts of money. But I was lucky. You know, I was like the first one to dance and there was no standard by which to know how much royalties to charge me or what to do. So we just came up with something that everybody thought was fair and off we went. And, uh, you know, it's one of these once in a lifetime things. I don't think anything like this can be duplicated again unless someone comes up with a totally new idea out of left field that none of the licensors or the leagues have a reference to know what to charge. But they had no idea what to charge. They just wanted me to recreate their history and and preserve uh, sort of the feeling of the game of the past for them. Uh, I'm sure they thought it was going to be a very, very small business, as I did. Uh, and it's a question you probably don't have on your on your sheet, but not really until... 1998 or 1999, when the urban hip hop and rap world sort of uh, embraced me, uh, it was a sleepy small business. It then very quickly exploded into something that I had no idea or concept could ever get that big. Yeah, that's great that you did mention that because I actually did have a note to ask about that, just about how the last 10 to 15 years or so, the influence of certain musicians uh, played a large role in further increasing the awareness of the brand. So when that first happened, and either through film clips or movies, when they made cameos or whatever it may have been, wore them at concerts. It wasn't that at all. Oh, really? No, it was a, a small store in Atlanta, Georgia called Distant Replay, which no longer is there right now. Right and two or three other stores around the country, and my own store, that uh, the hip-hop guys and, and the rappers came into and discovered these colorful uniforms that they had never seen before and that they sensed that no one else had, and they started buying them. I have to attribute it to two or three groups, maybe more than two or three, but Big Boy and Andre of Outkast were really at the very, very beginning when they started wearing vintage Dale Murphy Atlanta Braves jerseys. 
And then they started wearing uh, 1980 Nolan Ryan baseball jerseys from the Astros. I don't know if you remember the, the rainbow jersey. Uh, you see them every once in a while in turn back the clock games. But those two guys started wearing them in their videos. Uh, I had no sense that that was going to be very important. And then, I mean, I probably have relationships with and know 40 or 50 hip hop and rap artists over the years. Yep. I even get shout outs and mentioned in their videos. Oh, nice. I know. And it's, <laughs> and it, it, it just took me by surprise. And, Luckily, I had relationships with enough manufacturers to respond to the demand. You know, lots of times people interview me and they want to know, what was my marketing plan? How did I do this? And how did you make it explode so fast? And I say, I had no marketing plan. I had no idea it was going to explode. But I had good relationships with my vendors and manufacturers who, when we recognized that, you know, going from a million dollar company a year to a forty million dollar company a year overnight. Everybody got on board and supported me. It was completely crazy. Just staggering numbers, isn't it? When you talk about from one year to the next, how it can increase so remarkably. It went from I think in two thousand in two thousand one. In two thousand we did about one million. In two thousand one we did two point two million in 2002, we did 22 million, mm. and in 2003, we did 40 million. Just staggering. It was beyond the pale. It was crazy because I I had spent my life in a small business that had you know very rarely ever done over a million dollars a year. I was a local sporting goods company. It was it was fun making it happen, and it was fun getting to know all the guys in in the music world that that I would have never touched on in a million years. Very unique. Now, you alluded to this a little bit earlier uh, when you were talking about the late 1990s and then your involvement with the NBA, and that's around the time where the Hardwood Classics Collection came to be. We started uh, negotiating and talking in 1997. In 1998, I finally got the license, and they created the uh, NBA Hardwood Classics logo for me, as did Major League Baseball back in 1988, something called the Cooperstown Collection. Mm -hmm. All that was done in conjunction with, with our collections and what we were doing. So when I began with the NBA, the NBA was actually easier for me than Major League Baseball or the NFL because the NBA controlled their retired players and I didn't have to go make individual contracts with each individual retired player in the NBA. Right. They provided me with the names of the players. Um, although it got, got me in trouble with some NBA players because uh, their royalties that each individual player got in the NBA was somewhat less than the royalties I was paying to uh, football players and uh, baseball players. The NBA uh, was very, very helpful and made my life easier that I could just concentrate on making historic uniforms, not have to spend so much time negotiating with individual players as well. Now, Mitchell and Ness struck a deal that gave you the license and exclusive rights to reproduce Michael Jordan's Chicago Bulls jerseys. I negotiated that with Michael. and Oh, there you go. You know, it wasn't as hard as, as, as it seemed because, of course, Michael Jordan was a Nike guy. But at the time, the NBA was a, a Reebok organization and then Adidas. And I couldn't re reproduce any Michael Jordan jerseys because he wouldn't allow it. But eventually, he wanted his legacy to be uh, recreated, and he needed jerseys for places like Upper Deck and other people who he has autographing contracts with. And so I, I got some uh, an exclusive right with Jordan, and he was very easy to deal with. Uh, one time he asked me if, if he could have a credit for some of his kids for Mitchell and S stuff. <laughs> I said, okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> you've just answered the next question I was thinking. Did you deal directly with Michael or through uh, other business partners? But there you go, you were speaking directly with Michael himself. I've only spoken directly with Michael once or twice. And mostly it was, it was through his agents and also through the NBA. My research also led me to believe that you are a big fan of the former UCLA great and two-time NBA champion Bill Walton. What led to your fascination with Bill? Well, you know, I love Bill Walton because, uh, first, uh, when he played at UCLA, um, I never saw a man who could control a rebound, spin, and start a fast break and the outlet pass before his feet touched the, the ground again. 
I just love Bill Walton's uh, skills and amazing abilities uh, at UCLA. So, of course, I followed him. And I've done a lot of deals with Bill and gotten to know him. He's a wonderful gentleman. Of course, his team beat my Sixers uh, when we had all the all the star players, McGinnis and Irving and everyone, and still couldn't beat Walton. But I don't really care about that. I, I enjoyed Bill Walton, as I did Bill Russell, who was a great guy. As I love Alan Iverson. I was with Alan just a few weeks ago, who's a, uh, a wonderful man. I'm blessed to get to know people in professional sports as people, not just as interviews or as players. Yeah, that's fantastic. And of course, Iverson has very strong links, of course, with Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. That's where the flagship store is, is still based, correct? Right. We still have a flagship store in Philadelphia. And then there's another building where we have we have about 12,000 square feet of offices. But the making and the shipping and the manufacturing right now is all controlled by Adidas. You've talked about a lot of great pieces of memorabilia and great things you've had in your collection over the years. Do you actually have a most prized piece of memorabilia or is it too hard to narrow down to just one if you had to choose? No, I, I have... Um, I have my 1966-67 satin jacket of Wilt Chamberlain Oh, nice! that I love. I have my Mickey Mantle rookie jersey from 1951 that I love and my, my Lou Gehrig 1939 Yankees jersey uh, that I love. Here's a story that it always warms my heart. So I don't have one now, but I wish I did. One of my favorite football players, and, and it's only because of uh, reading the history of football, was a guy named Sammy Ball, slinging Sammy Ball of the Washington Redskins. And Sammy Sammy began in 1937 with the Skins, and he, he ended in 1952, I think. And he was actually the first coach of the New York Titans before they renamed them the New York Jets. And Sammy was, I think, was from Texas Christian or, or one of the Texas schools. Um, he wore number 33 with the Redskins. And over the period of years of playing for the Redskins, he led the league in passing. He led the league in touchdowns. He led the league in yardage. He led the league in punting. He also led the league in interceptions for two years because he was the safety on the Redskins. These are the days when they played both ways. Okay. I just love Sammy. And... He wore this plain maroon jersey with just a number 33 on the front and back, the most unrecognizable jersey you would ever know. So I called Sammy and I said, I want to make your jersey, Sammy. Sammy's passed away now. I said, I want to make your jersey. And I said, we have to make a deal. He says, no, just send me the money. I'm not signing any deals. So I made a deal where I sent, I think I, I was sending Sammy 9% of the wholesale price of the jersey. And I made this number 33 jersey and I put it in the store. And of all people, Jay-Z gets a hold of it, and he decides he likes it, and he wears it in one of his musical videos called Girls, Girls, Girls. <laughs> and Girls, Girls, Girls is one of the big songs, and it's it's shot in New York City in the subway system and at parties, and Jay-Z's wearing this jersey. It becomes the number one selling jersey in my company for two and a half years. <laughs> I'm sending Sammy Ball, who's like 92 years old, <laughs> Four and five thousand dollar royalty check every month. <laughs> he calls me one day and he says, in this hard to duplicate Texas draw, he says, Peter, he says, I, I have no idea why you're sending me all this money, but it's more money than I ever made in the NFL, and I just want to thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and all I said to Sammy was, Sammy, you're a legend. They'll never forget you. There was no way I was going to tell him. In a million years till the day he died, that it was because of Jay Z in some really cool MTV VH1 uh, played. One of the things that I didn't know about MTV and VH1 is if they get a music video they like, they could play it 30 to 60 times a day. And then they play it week after week after week. I mean, I'd have to be Nike to afford that kind of advertising. That's a <laughs> tremendous story. And it's also very touching as well as a as a tribute to uh, a player in Sammy that you obviously admired so much. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Um, now, in 2007, you sold Mitchell & Ness to Adidas, or we say Adidas over here in Australia. <laughs> um, can you describe how it felt to finally hand over the business that you and your family had built pretty much from the ground up after uh, your father initially took it over from the original founders? Well, I should backtrack a little bit. Like any like any son who takes over his father's business, you know what the sons do when they take over their father's business? They drive it into bankruptcy. So <laughs> I 
I I went I went bankrupt in uh, 1978 and then again in 1983 and uh, and October of 83 it was so bad I said to my girlfriend I can't get any worse let's get married <laughs> I said but you've got to come work for me I don't have any employees so. So in November of 83, Fran and I got married uh, and a company was reduced to maybe three or four employees and then finally just down to us. I got married late. I was 40 years old and, and Fran was 29 or 30. And and we struggled for many years until we, until we achieved this success and we never had any children. And my brothers, uh, one brother's passed away and my other brother's in his 80s. And um, I didn't have anyone to leave this business to. And the business, to, to be honest with you, was struggling a bit between 2006 and 2007 because the, the uh, uniqueness of the vintage jersey had kind of run its course. It was more of a fashion trend than I expected. And so I'm getting older and the company is not doing that well. And Adidas made me an offer that I couldn't refuse. Uh, and I said, sure. Uh, you know, there was, a, to me, it was like a natural evolution. I'm just handing it over. And I think the thing that I like, it's not that I miss business or feel bad about selling it. It's that the name Mitchell and Ness, I feel, will be preserved forever. It's, uh, it's bigger now than I ever could have made it. Uh, it will continue to be very um, important whether Adidas continues to hold on to it or whether they sell it. Um, so I, I will go to my grave knowing that I've preserved the name and the name Mitchell and Ness will be on the sports landscape uh, in America for who knows how long, much longer than I'll be alive. Incredible story and an incredible turnaround from how close it must have come to completely giving it away when you said that you were bankrupt for a second time in 1983. Yeah. You know, it's interesting how, how fate intervenes in things. I put my house up for sale for $80,000 and was going to try and buy a tennis shop in Newtown, Pennsylvania. There was a small tennis shop for sale. And I, I was uh, very involved in the tennis world as well when uh, Mitchell and Ness was active in the 60s and 70s. And if someone had made me an offer on our house for $80,000 in 1983, I would have sold it and move to Newtown, and I'd, I'd still be stringing tennis rackets. No one made me an offer, and I was trapped, and I had to figure out how to make some money. But I know for sure that if that offer had come in and I would have sold my house, I wouldn't be talking to you right now. It's just an incredible sequence of events, isn't it, and just how circumstance plays itself out. Circumstances, uh, I was very, very lucky. Um, and also, when you're desperate, you either panic or you get your creative juices on and figure out how to make it work. So I, I do pat myself on the back for figuring out how to make it work. Oh, for sure. Now, speaking of the creative juices there, was it only a year or so after you did have that second bankruptcy? Is that around the time when you had the idea to use the leftover materials that you found? Yes. I mean, some of these stories are on the, on the web, but in 1984, in those days, baseball cards were very big. Yep. But jersey collectors were out there. They were kind of under the radar, baseball jersey collectors. And I was one of the few people who knew the lettering and sewing applications and how to repair very expensive jerseys, jerseys that were collectibles that would sell. Even in the 80s, they were selling for $10,000, $20,000, $30,000 dollars a jersey. Wow. And really what happened was, a couple people came in. One was a St. Louis Browns jersey. I think it was Roy Seavers. Um, another was a, a Pittsburgh Pirates vest. I think it was Bob Skinner and would ask me to repair them. They were old flannel jerseys where the lettering was coming off, the piping. And so when I took them over to my local manufacturer and was repairing them, that's when I discovered and I said, what's all that old wool flannel doing over there on the shelves? And the manufacturer said, oh, we don't use it anymore. Wool flannel in baseball uniforms ended in 1972. The last team to wear wool flannel was uh, the 1972 Boston Red Sox. And they said, we don't use it anymore. It sits there. It has no purpose. And I saw this white with navy pinstripe and red pinstripe and gray and solid white. I said, well, these jerseys that I'm asking you to repair, can you make me five or six of them uh, in addition to repairing the original? And my manufacturer said, sure. So the people who asked me to repair the jerseys, I gave them back their repaired jerseys, and I gave them a replica that was so close they couldn't tell the difference. And I said, look, 
keep the repair jersey in the cedar closet because that's the one that's going to sell for thousands and show people this replica. I used to make the comparison to Joan Collins in Dynasty where she'd keep the real diamonds in the in the vault and wear the glass ones out <laughs> in case somebody ripped her necklace off. And that's how it all began. And when I saw that I put four or five jerseys in my store and people saw them and they were shocked and just bought them instantly, I realized that I had tapped into something. Let's just keep going with it and see what happens. I made like 12,000 jerseys the first year. I used up all the wool flannel. I couldn't make them fast enough. And that's how it all got started. It's just really is incredible. And I find it absolutely fascinating, the whole story as well. And I appreciate you taking the time out to chat with me about it. And I'm sure that as a lover of nostalgia, the listener of this podcast enjoyed this as much as I have as well. Just in relation to Mitchell and Ness, the nostalgia company, how did that name come about with the adding of the nostalgia company? What year did that come into play? I had to do that because Mitchell and Ness was a retail store and I needed to form a wholesale business to acquire licenses with the Ligs. From the point of view of the Ligs, I'm selling to other stores, Macy's and Nordstrom, uh, selling to sporting goods stores like Models or selling to uh, all other kinds of uh, smaller specialty sporting goods stores. So I had to form a wholesale corporation to uh, acquire these licenses and pay my licensing fees through. And the name Mitchell and Ness was starting to get so well known, I just said, well, let's call the new corporation the Mitchell and Ness Nostalgia Company. The other corporation would be Mitchell and Ness Store. So when you walked into the Mitchell and Ness Store, you were buying something as a consumer. But if you owned a sporting goods company or a chain of stores, or, or if you were a, a Nordstrom or a Macy's, you were buying things from the Mitchell and Ness Nostalgia Company. I don't know if that makes sense to you. It's a, it's the difference between wholesale pricing and retail pricing, how the world of uh, business structure works from the manufacturer to the retailer to the consumer. I appreciate the clarification there. It just rolls off the tongue. The word nostalgia is obviously very much linked to Mitchell and Ness. So, of course, it works hand in hand very well together. Mitchell and Ness, nostalgia company with all its lifestyle clothing and fan clothing, uh, gets its inspiration from all the original colors and the original logos and original designs of the historic teams. So anything that you buy from Mitchell and Ness, even if you go in and buy a t-shirt or a hoodie or a sweatshirt, the ingredients in that are all linked to the past of the team. It's just not something made up out of the blue. And I like that a lot. Yeah, I think that's what adds to the importance and the uniqueness of the company as well. Thank you again for the opportunity to connect with you today and chat about the incredible history of the company and, and your key involvement in it and your families as well. It's been really great to chat with you today, Peter. Well, thank you very much, Adam. And thanks for bringing me into the 21st century. This is my first use of Skype. <laughs> and thank you again. Take care. Thanks for listening. I welcome your interaction with the show. Suggest topics or guests you want to hear conversations with. You can leave a voicemail. Simply visit inallairness.com slash voice. Click start recording, leave your message and press stop. You can even listen back before submitting. Press send and you're done. Worldwide, the show currently has 56 reviews, 53 on iTunes and 3 on Stitcher. Thanks for your continued support. If you do add a review, I'd love to read it out on a future episode. Your ratings and reviews are one of the best ways to support the podcast. If you enjoy the show, please tell your basketball-loving friends about it. Your word-of-mouth recommendations are certainly worth their weight in gold. You can subscribe to my show in various ways. iTunes, visit inallairness.com slash review. Add it to your Stitcher playlist, inallairness.com slash Stitcher. You can also subscribe on Pocket Casts, Player FM, TuneIn Radio, other podcatchers, and of course, via the Podcasts app on your iOS device of choice. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show and share my web address with your friends and colleagues in allairness.com. Check out the podcast archive for plenty more episodes with high-profile guests. Follow me on Twitter at inallairness. Please add your like to the show's social hub, facebook.com slash inallairness. Join me next time for another edition of the show.